Jerry Prevo. Um, I'm Professor Emeritus of Political Science and Latin American Studies from College of St. Benedict, St. John's University uh, here in Minnesota. Um, it's been my privilege to study and research and teach about Cuba over um, more, than, more than four decades. Um, I've been to the island more than uh, 20 times, both taking students there and establishing uh, research relationships with uh, Cuban professors and had the privilege of um, writing and editing books on both uh, Cuban life and also U.S.-Cuban uh, relations. So this, this uh, particular series was, uh, from filmmaker Gloria Rolando is a very important one. Uh, she undertook this after completing a particularly important uh, trilogy uh, a few years back on some very painful events of Cuban history from the Republican period, from uh, the year 1912, when there were some very uh, race-oriented massacres that happened against uh, Cubans of African heritage, events that had sort of been buried by the authorities at the time and, and not really even studied after the revolution. And she made it her mission to tell those stories and to produce a trilogy of wonderful uh, films on it. Uh, we had the opportunity in our Minnesota Cuba Committee uh, annual film festival to show those. This project emerged later. I think you can tell, um, you know, Gloria is, is in the film several times. Um, as she's, um, and, and narrates parts of it. She was motivated to do this particular series because I think as you picked up, it was her mother was uh, educated by the, uh, by the Oblates. I think I picked up that she was educated in, in, in the night school of the Oblates uh, rather than in the, um, rather than in the uh, grade school. I, I think this is a, yeah, it's, it's a particularly important trilogy. Some of you saw the, the first part last week and now you've seen this part tonight that really in some ways uh, sets it up well. I had the privilege last year when I was in Cuba in December of being with Gloria when she had the opportunity to present this segment uh, as part of the very prestigious Latin American Film Festival that happens in Havana every uh, December. And at that event, I had the opportunity to meet many of the women who are in the film, who are the uh, graduates of the Oblate schools, who uh, went on to uh, wonderful careers post-revolution, especially in education, but in many other fields after their training uh, by the Oblate uh, sisters. Uh, when they were young, and especially this group with people that would have been in those schools in the 30s, 40s, and, uh, and 50s. Uh, I'm going to take questions, but just, uh, just a little bit of background of how uh, these schools that they founded in Camaway and in Havana and in Santiago, how they fit into Cuban life at that point um, of the beginning of the Cuban Republic at the end of Spanish colonialism. <clears throat> Slavery only ended in Cuba in 1886, so 21 years after the end of slavery in the United States and some 60 years after the end of slavery in the British Empire. So Cuba was just emerging out of slavery for the for the black population of Cuba. So if you think about it, when they're founding these schools, basically 14 years after the end of, of slavery, in a society that was deeply uh, racially split and class conscious, their willingness to take what they had done in the United States of teaching children of African heritage 
to Cuba at that point at the start of the Cuban Republic was particularly significant because they were able to create an educational system that uh, at the time of the Republic, which is formed in 1901 after the defeat of the Spanish and the beginning of their independence, though under strong American domination, they were able to provide an opportunity for the children of the uh, African descended population of Cuba, together with some others, as mentioned, and also Chinese, um, that uh, daughters of uh, Chinese uh, families were also uh, included in, in this. And, and if you think about it in a way, they were, as Professor Nymphs, for those of you here last week, talked, this Cuban society that emerges in 1900 after the departure of the Spanish is one which is in a lot of ways parallel to the racial divisions in the United States where black families had to construct alternative institutions if their children were to be educated and, and to prosper. And as you know, during the year in that era, post-Civil War in the United States, that happened. And the Oblate Sisters Education of Black Children in Maryland, I'm sure was very much a part of that. And they took that experience and with that ethos and with that uh, commitment, they, they took that to Cuba. And over the course of the decades that followed, um, they were the, the ones that uh, provided those uh, black children in Cuba the opportunity to study and grow in a way that if they had not been there, um, would, would, would generally not have have happened. Um, so it's, it's a very inspiring story, I think. And the connection, of course, ironically, to this place, to St. Peter Claver, is, is fascinating because um, it, it's actually 14 years before the uh, sisters uh, leave Cuba that this parish, uh, as it opens a school, turns to the Oblates to educate uh, black children here in, uh, in St. Paul. So that's the, the sort of the incredible connection. And then you heard it, some of the nuns who left Cuba in 1961 and came back to Maryland and did their teaching and their work uh, in, in Maryland, some of them also were, uh, came and were assigned here in St. Paul in the years after in the years after 1961, the reference to the to the Cuban nun, for example, who taught uh, who taught Spanish. Exactly how many of them came here, we don't. I don't think that's exactly in the in the record. But uh, I hope you found it to be again for this parish and for the people here just a particularly touching and moving story that. Uh, gives a little more background to the sisters that uh, came here and, and, and taught for, for so many years in, in St. Peter Claver Church. And while they are no longer here, it's, it's, it's wonderful that the, that the church uh, and, the, and the school continue um, and to educate uh, um, African-American children here in, the, here in St. Paul. So I'm open to any, any questions, any thoughts that anyone has about uh, the issues that are raised uh, in the film. Yes? Did most of the sisters come back to the United States, to Baltimore, did some stay? A small number, my understanding is that a small number of them, I think maybe three or four or five, uh, chose to leave the order and to stay, and to stay in Cuba. Exactly how well documented that is. I'm, that's probably documented in the archives of the, uh, of the order, because they obviously if someone is leaving the order, that is, a, is marked and noted. But the, the, the great majority did um, because of their religious vocation, they, they decided to 
um, to stay um, with uh, with the order, and that meant returning to the United States because it was not possible. There were no more private schools in Cuba forward from from 1961 uh, as a decision of the of the revolutionary government. The, the relations with the overall Catholic Church in Cuba at that time was not good. Um, because it was a church in Cuba, the hierarchy was generally very much connected to the old order, to the Batista dictatorship. Many of the priests were from Spain, um, and, and very much from Spain, that meant you're talking about the era of Francisco Franco, the dictator. So they, they were very much in contradiction uh, to, the, to the revolution. In fact, even though, as I think Professor Nims pointed out last week, even though churches fully remained open, at no point was religion or um, any of any religion uh, prohibited in Cuba, the churches remained open, but seminaries were closed, the schools were closed, and, old, and it took, I think, eight years, no, I'm sorry, 11 years from 1959 until there was actually a, a kind of a, pact struck between the Vatican and the uh, Cuban uh, government as to exactly how Catholic, you know, Catholicism would, would go forward. Religious orders, as was pointed out, that did work other than education, it, in the health system or in social work, those, some of those stayed in Cuba and others have gone back. Uh, Sister uh, Mother Teresa's order, for example, went went there beginning in the 1980s. Um, but the ability to, for them as educators to have a role in the exclusively public education system of Cuba was not possible. Gary, could you mention about Gloria being here? Oh yeah, we're, we're, <laughs> we're just about to um, confirm, but I think we can say that it will happen. Gloria herself um, is scheduled to come to Chicago this week, the director of the, the film is scheduled to come to Chicago next week, and we're in the process of making the arrangements for her to spend Saturday and Sunday uh, next weekend with us here in the Twin Cities. Yeah. And, there, and obviously one of the reasons to bring her here is for next Saturday night in the showing of the third segment of the, uh, of the series, uh, for her to be here with you and uh, to share uh, her thoughts and to meet uh, to meet all of you, um, so we'll we'll keep you posted as the week. We're just in the process of working out um, some of the the details, but she's going to be in Chicago for a few days as part of a. She's working on a a new documentary with a fascinating subject. Exactly how it's going to be approached, we're not yet sure, uh, that has to do with the Buffalo soldiers, mm -hmm. the African-American soldiers. The connection to Cuba is that there was a contingent of Buffalo soldiers who participated in the Spanish-American Cuban War in 1898 and were part of the liberation of Santiago from the Spanish army. And so it's, it's a fascinating story that's been documented in a couple of, of books. And it sort of took uh, Gloria's fancy. I had a chance to meet with her last December and talk about it. And I know she's been working on it over this past year. And she's coming here uh, now to the United States to talk about this project and to raise some money for it. Uh, so we hope to have her here uh, for the 515 wow. Uh, meeting and next week we'll keep you posted. And hopefully some other venue too if we can put it together. Yeah, there, there will also likely be one other public event on Sunday where she okay, will yeah. be. I'm just talking to the East Side Freedom Library now. Maybe we could uh, set something up with them. Yeah, it's, it's possible that that even could be the uh, locale for, sure. uh, for it. So yeah, we'll, we will keep you posted. Do you know what the link was to get the invitation for the sisters to come here? I mean, we... we yeah, that's the thing. I don't who, think who do, we know definitively, okay. except that I know some of the, of, the, of the members here have shared that 
Um, there were, in that era at the end of the, of, after the Second World War, there wasn't, uh, some white Catholic parents were not entirely comfortable with their children going to, uh, to Catholic school with, with black children. And so the idea of a, um, of a new school connected to this parish, which obviously had been in existence as an African-American parish, parish was, uh, was raised. And exactly why the, the Obelates, because I gather in the conversation with you that there are, there might have been a couple of other orders of black nuns in the United States that might have been turned to, but why they, you know, particularly uh, turned to the, uh, to the Obelates, um, I'm not sure, but I think it, the, the fact that it was an order of black nuns was clearly a part of the motivation and the idea of creating the, the school here at St. Peter Claver in 1947. And they were willing to take it on, uh, even though they did still at that point in 1947, they, they, they obviously were going very strong in, uh, in, in, in Cuba with many different schools there. I don't know the whole picture of how many different schools uh, they had beyond their academy in, uh, in Baltimore. I'm not as familiar with all of that. You said New Orleans, sir? Mm -hmm. New, New Orleans, another, they, they did have a, and I think um, what uh, Father Kevin was telling me that they are also at uh, the St. Leonard's. In North Minneapolis? In North South Minneapolis. Minneapolis. Yeah, which, yeah. which school in North Minneapolis? Yeah. South, 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 South Fort Maurice. South Minneapolis. South Minneapolis. Yeah. St. Leonard's. Yeah. It's where. Um, Fort Bet. Laverne Williams. Yes. Yeah, I'm not yeah. sure where it is. It's in South Minneapolis, okay. Because he was telling me that, and he had some Cuban um, parishioners. Were there okay. oblates there? He said there were. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, but I told him about this. He yeah. Said, yeah. Did they, the question that, was there a, did they live in a convent on the I grounds here? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right next door. Yeah. Right next door. Yeah. 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 yeah, there's, yeah. there's another That's building still. on but it's possible that they also, from that convent, might have done service at other, at other schools in the, uh, in the Twin Cities. I, that again, not, we came at this more knowing the Cuba side of the story and in the process we've, you know, we've, um, we've learned more, you know, about these, you know, their, their presence uh, here. Our, our organization, the Minnesota Cuba Committee, we, we did some programming here probably 15, 20 years ago, but it wasn't at that time in it with any knowledge or connection to the Oblates or that, because by that time they, they had moved on, they were no longer connected to the, uh, to the church, so we didn't really know that history until uh, Gloria uh, unearthed it with her, uh, with her film and then, you know, making the connection here as we thought of a, a place. I know it happened, Franklin, uh, actually approached, uh, we were trying to get the, this film shown potentially at uh, St. Kate's, and, and actually the people he contact, contacted there suggested, well, I think this would be the best, the best uh, locale uh, to, to do it. Though I still think it would be valuable to potentially uh, show it also at, uh, that's where to I the students heard, at St. Kate's. That's where I heard the call. Yeah, from the sisters at St. Kate's, right? It's interesting right. that you were, uh, when, around the time the Oblates came, in the late 40s, and then the, the black migration, I mean, that's from the South. That's how my parents got here. My mother came here in 1948 for opportunity for employment. Sure. And I'm just thinking historically, that movement of African Americans from the South to the North, to get fine work, to find employment, livelihood. My father came in about 46. Mm. And I'm just, uh, I, right now when you were saying as the nuns came, and then I was just relating that to my parents moving here at the same time, which they both converted to Catholicism and raised all six of us Catholic. That's how I mm. got here. But I was just hearing the, I could just 
see, feel the movement of that migration and then the Oblates were coming here. I, it just kind of hit yeah, me all at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure there were other, you know, there were other, other cities also where you know, where the black population had Chicago. migrated to Chicago. that had uh, either, that had originally were Catholic in the South or had, had converted. And so there, there was uh, um, schools that uh, came to be formed, again, because of that era, the nature, you know, America was still a very racially divided society in, in 1946 and the Twin Cities particularly so. I mean, when you look back at the, at the history of the Twin Cities and the level Sadly, the level of racism and anti-Semitism that existed in, in this Twin Cities in the 1930s and 1940s, that sadly, you know, led in some ways to the fact that a separate school needed to be formed because there, because there were um, white Catholic families that weren't ready to have their children um, educated alongside some of the African American families that had come up from the South. Just, it's part of the history. And in the case of Cuba, you know, again, the, these, um, the, uh, the republic that was formed in 1900, um, independent of the Spanish, yes, but still primarily led by the same families that had collaborated with and lived with Spanish colonialism and had been privileged under it. The, Cuba was a society where it was a very much of a color line of how white you were was your level of Privilege, and therefore those that were, could put their lineage most back to Spain um, at both sides of the family, and therefore white, um, were in a privileged position. And so the schools that they would have that they that would have created, especially the private ones, would not have, you know, seen room for the the children of, of African heritage whose parents mostly. Um, you know, were domestic workers or uh, tobacco workers. Um, and so that's where the Oblates came in, the formation of these four or five different schools that, uh, for, for girls that developed. I, what I'm not familiar with, because the story is only about the Oblates who, who generally uh, educated girls, I'm not, there is probably another side to this, some schools that, uh, um, Involved uh, young black boys, but I don't I don't know anything about that history. It's likely that that was also. There. Yeah, you know, as far as the schools go, every parish was supposed to have a school. That was kind of a archdiocesan <coughs> requirement. If you wanted to have a parish, you should have a school too. So you have the whole circle, like Guadalupe. The Hispanics started Guadalupe, and the blacks started this one. I don't know that they ever did that in Minneapolis. But this was the strongest African American community. And then you had to find your teachers. So I suspect the pastor here found the sisters mm -hmm. and called them up and said, Would you like to be in the church? Because yeah, that's, that's what, what they we usually say. We're, you're, you're, your current them. pastor was wondering about the exact uh, history, uh, history of that. Though we've been knowing the Catholic Church, yeah. the diocese, you know, the diocesan leaders had to be involved. I don't think that. That the priest, as good as he may have been, it wouldn't have had on his own uh, uh, authority to, to do that. There had to be some higher level. Um, uh, they just looking wanted into somebody it. to teach. They really yeah. didn't care. Yeah. <laughs> so, for those of you who have that history here, who was the pastor at the opening of St. Peter Claver? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's in the, it's in, the uh, it's in your book, the 125th anniversary book. Um, like yeah. Father, I just Father remember Theobald. Father Luger and Father Worth. That's Father all right. Yeah. 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 yeah, I think Theobald had died 32, 15 years yeah. before that. And he would have he would had a kind of more national presence, Father Theobald. Yeah. 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 He could have been connected. Yeah. Yeah. And he's from Guyana. Yeah, it was Jerome Luger. Yeah. Yeah. Pastor 1950, 42 to 1954. So it was during his 12 years. Um, as the pastor when the whole, you know, when the school was created and the oblates were, um, were, were arranged to be the, to be the teachers. Uh, right, it's probably those, those records, <laughs> exactly the details of it. Maybe it's in some 
archives at the at the diocesan offices in St. Paul. It might well might well be there. I'm sure it probably is of, of that history if someone wants to wants to research it. I have a question. And after the you know, those, you know, the beginning of the revolution, when you know some priests you know, were expelled. And uh, when you know what the revolutionary government start easing the tension and the animosity against you know what the organized religion, uh, the Pope you know was there. Right. I mean, the, the first of all, the only priests that were quote unquote expelled were those who were not Cuban. I mean, no Cuban no, priests. No, it was they. They were they were Spanish priests yeah. that were the ones that. Uh, um, were in most cases were, were expelled from the country. As I said, the beginning of better relations came with an agreement between the Vatican and the Cuban government in 1969, 10 years after the, after the revolution. But it didn't include the reopening of, uh, for training of seminarians or for um, Catholic education. I would say the, the the greater changes or more involvement of the current Cuban Catholic Church and Cuban life really comes with the advent of liberation theology. When, and, the, and the Latin American bishops who in 1968, and that probably even had a factor in the 69 agreement, began to reorient at least in in, in rhetorical terms, the focus of the church toward social justice, uh, away from some of the uh, previous uh, focus of the, of the church in Latin America. And so over time, that, I think the Cubans were, were, were quite um, taken by the events in Nicaragua, where a revolution that they very much supported and very much in, encouraged uh, that that revolution had very um, much connection to Catholic uh, liberation theology with priests uh, in, that, in, in, that, in that government, Father Carvinal and, and others. And, and that, I think, had an influence on the uh, Cuban leaders. And at that point, I think the, the maximum leader of the revolution, Fidel, began to speak more openly of his Catholic upbringing and his training by the Jesuits and the and the, more willing to state that, that the ideas of social justice that he got from the Jesuits in his younger years before he became a, a communist, a radical, uh, were important in, in, his, uh, in his thinking. And then, in, in the early 90s, the, a key thing happened. Uh, up until that time, uh, I mean, Cuba had always been and still is a, a secular state with sharp distinction between you know, church and state. But membership in the, in the Communist Party was not possible for any one of faith, whether it was Santeria or, or being a Baptist or being a Catholic. And the bylaws of the Communist Party were changed in, 1960, in 1992 to allow those of faith to become members of the party. Well, you know, the Constitution, is, is you have, you know, the freedom of religion. Yeah, the freedom of religion had always been there. Yeah. But it, it was also true that you couldn't be a member of the Communist Party between 1959 and 1992 and be a you know and be an active Catholic or Baptist or Santerista. That you know that changed and even led today, then even today. No, as I said, it was changed. It was allowed then after 92 for the last 30 years um, that became you know became possible. And obviously, some that had those faiths did did become members of the become members of the party, and then that those openness, I think, you know, led to the fact that um, you had the papal visits, uh, both you know, both uh, Pope John Paul and uh, Pope Benedict 
both made you know public trips to to Cuba, where like you know, in, in a sense, they were treated like in the other places where the Pope has gone, where there were huge public masses, where the government encouraged uh, people, not just Catholics, but uh, you know, all Cubans, to come and to to greet the uh, the popes. And so the success of those uh, of those visits, 1998, and then I forget the date of Pope Benedict's visit. Those, you know, again, those improved the the relationship between the government and the and the and the Catholic Church. But you know, again, as I say, there still remains the tension that um, there is not religious education in Cuba. Cuba does remain entirely. There's no private education in Cuba. It's not something that's given to any religious order to. Um, whether they're Baptist or Evangelical or Catholic, or, you know, there's only public education in Cuba. But the relations between the, the church um, and the government have definitely uh, been better, and the, the church has served at a certain at certain moments in the last 20 years, uh, sometimes negotiating uh, between the government for um, the release of people who have been run afoul of Cuban law with their political attitudes and have been, there are the arrangements for them to, to go into exile or be released from, from prison has been facilitated uh, by, the, by the Roman Catholic Church. And the opening, sadly as it was, short in 2015-16 between the, our two governments, um, the, the Vatican was very involved, along with the Canadian government, in brokering that agreement between the Obama administration and the government of Raul Castro. So, yeah, there's a, there, there definitely a, also, a greater, a greater accommodation than there once was. Also, the, the negotiation on the release of the last of the Novak Cuban five. And it's changed on that. Yes, yeah, the whole right. That was part of the of the opening and the release of the of the of the Cuban five and then taking back to the, the United States of the American contractor Alan Gross, right, the Cuban right, the, the Cuban communist uh, Cuban excuse me, the Cuban Catholic Church was very involved in that. Any other any other questions, observations? We we very much look forward to next Saturday night, the third of our trilogy, and to having uh, Gloria here. As soon as we have it absolutely um, secured, Franklin will send an email that probably will uh, be by tomorrow um, to let you know that uh, she is going to be here, and we look forward to, uh, to having that exchange. Um, another local uh, Cuban, uh, Ofunshi, um, who is a... Uh, uh, a priest of Santa Maria um, will be here, and with you know to share his uh, thoughts and experiences alongside of of Gloria. So, okay. well, thank, thank you very you. much. Yeah. Thank okay, you. thank you.